I, I, I'd like to ask everybody here is um, how many of you vote? <coughs> everybody votes. That's very good. How many of you are interested in politics? Uh, everyone's <laughs> interested in politics. Great. I have an ambition to make. I very rarely vote. And when I did politics at university, I'm actually uh, not, I've never been, well, I have been interested in Westminster politics, but never in a way that's kind of inspired me to make many films. I've made a couple of films, but in general, the idea of making films about politics is a bit of an anathema. It's really hard to engage people. Um, but anyway, one day I got a proposal. Um, it was sent from a production company, um, uh, which was about politics. And my first reaction was no, but then I read it. And there were two things that, uh, that, that struck a chord with me. Um, this is a, a film which is looking about how to improve politics, which again is a bit of a yawn, but there were two things that were in it um, which I thought really caught my attention. The first thing was the idea behind the whole film was to set up a new Magna Carta. This is the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. It's a, doc it's a document that's meant to underlie the democratic freedoms that we have today. And the idea behind this film was, if we were to have a new Magna Carta, what would it have? And the idea was, we boil it down to three simple things. And two of these simple things really caught my imagination. The first one was that to make it illegal to lie in Parliament. Um, and that was the first thing that kind of caught my attention, because I don't think politicians tell the truth. And also, I didn't realize it was not illegal to lie in Parliament. The second thing was to um, limit the amount of money that people can give to a political party, and thereby curb the influence that big money has on politics. And that was another thing that struck me as really interesting. Um, so I think that that was, that was what started me off on this journey. Um, but the journey began well before I got engaged. And, and it started with, uh, with, with Jolly. So well, before we got Jolly. engaged. We're going to have a civil partnership. So. We've been engaged. We've had a divorce. It's been great. Uh, it's all over. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, taking us back to the, the very beginning, I present to you Jolly and Ruth. <laughs> so, first of all, thanks a lot for coming. Um, Emeka is absolutely right. Politics is really boring. And it's really boring to make films about. Um, so trying to make a film that's funny and engaging and it can appeal to people who are really knowledgeable about politics as well as who have absolutely no interest in it at all was really the brief that I wanted to fulfill. How many of you have seen The Revolution Will Be Televised? Just put your hand up. Okay, actually not that many of you. Okay, so for three years I was making a program that was a comedy that was uh, basically sort of the way we pitched it initially was what would happen if you put Ali G in a blender with Panorama, <laughs> you know, to give you a sort of sense of the sort of jeopardy filled stunts that would also kind of have a sense of meaning and importance. Because for me, when I was growing up, what I recognised when I'd look at things on television, particularly presented their programs, was how I would look straight through people who weren't authentic, who didn't mean what they said, and who were basically a kind of done for hire. This is really weird, this mic, it's like dropping in <laughs> and out and then in. It's like some weird, like, Darth Vader, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's turn it off. So, so. I studied uh, politics and international relations at Sussex Uni, uh, not too far from here. And when I was at university, 9-11 happened. That was a very powerful moment for anyone who actually watched the planes smash into the towers, uh, watched live footage afterwards, and then watched the real madness of Afghanistan and Iraq unfold, uh, who was part of a demonstration either in London there was over a million people who walked on the streets, or where I was in New York, where there was 300,000 people who weren't allowed to walk three blocks and had to walk a 40-block circle to get around. I watched women as old as my 60-year-old mother being put in handcuffs and dragged 
across the street because they really didn't like you protesting in New York a year after 9-11. And it politicised me. And I didn't feel that I had any... Sorry, I haven't missed much. Don't worry about it. Get down. Uh, I've known people who've been in the army as well. Like I knew people who'd seen war. You'd seen bodies ripped apart by armaments. Things that we're completely sanitised from in the West. And I'd also known a lot of people who worked uh, in, who had, got, who had studied and then gone into either working um, uh, in, in, in MPs' offices or in non-governmental organisations, NGOs. And when I say that, I mean organisations like Greenpeace, organisations uh, like Oxfam. Uh, and for me, I felt very disenchanted with politics. I knew I wasn't going, going to go into politics, um, but I'd studied it. And because I'd studied it, I knew quite a lot about it. And like a lot of things that you know quite a lot about, but you don't have something to, you, you don't have the ability to uh, use any of that knowledge. I would get drunk with my friends, and I would start talking about it at really inappropriate times, because it was depressing. You know, like we'd go to a dinner party, and I'd get drunk, and I'd be like, yeah, the thing is about, you know, the project for the new American century and neoconservatism. And people were like, who is this guy? Why is he talking about this? We're supposed to be having fun. And um, years and years later, uh, a friend of mine who I'd grown up with decided to dig up an MP's garden uh, in the shape of a pound sign because he, <laughs> to protest the gardening bills that he claimed on expenses. And that guy's name is Hayden Prowse. And we'd known each other since we were eight years old. And we ended up starting this journey where we made uh, the first series, and that one, the BAFTA for Best Comedy. It beat Alan Partridge and some fantastic comedians, Cardinal Burns. And then we made a second and a third series eventually in America. And then I got to the point where the BBC was saying, look, as the message said, it's the 800 year anniversary of Magna Carta, and we're going to be doing this season of films. Um, we'd like to see you try and do a narrative. So we started talking about how to do a narrative. Narrative filmmaking and making like a magazine show, which is what they call when you've got like 16 different items in a show and it sort of changes after three minutes, are completely different. But that was something that Ed Mechner had been doing for the last, what, 10, 10 years? 15? 15 years. Um, I think I'm sitting next to me so I can like stroke your name. He likes to be kind of like in charge, you know, like behind the desk. <laughs> no, you, you can put a fucking PowerPoint on it. Um, yeah. Um, so um, basically, um, the thing I think that. Uh, that oh, now he's going to come sit down. <laughs> Just because I said he liked the deck. Because I fucked the deck. It's not my number. Um, uh, with, with, with narrative films, the thing that makes narrative films interesting, things have to happen. Um, and the problem with politics is that nothing really happens. What happens in politics is people talk about politics. Things kind of get discussed, issues, isms, um, and that's the problem with politics as far as making a film about it goes, and that's the problem with politics as far as politics goes. Mm. But what was different about this was that we had a device, which was a series of stunts, which is what um, uh, the revolution we televised um, did, which actually highlighted issues and made people aware of issues, but in a very humorous way. Um, and in the kind of absurdity of it, um, uh, you'd actually learn quite a lot. Um, so that was the thing that, um, that interested me and excited me. And uh, <coughs> that's why I decided to do it. And for us, the challenge has been to weave those two together in a way that makes a narrative film, um, but at the same time keeps that sort of light mm. um, interested where things are happening and when you're in your face, sort of stunt, to try and provoke people's interest in a subject that they would never normally consider. Um, now, this is a real challenge. Um, we fell out. Mm. Everyone fell out in the production. It's a, a meeting of minds, this film, because in, in a sense, I don't know, don't know that it had really been tried um, in, in this way before. Well, not recently, but I think, not yeah. in the last like, five or 10 years. But I think what it did was that we, I mean, the things that we, of course, would not have got right, 
um, as you never do with, with these things, especially when they're relatively new. Um, um, but what we're trying to do is keep people who would never normally watch along for a journey where we began to let them know that actually a lot of the things that they think are boring are things that run their lives and things that actually have the capacity to change the world that they live in. Um, obviously, you can't go too far in it, um, and that, this was the kind of battle. And what was also interesting about it is that all of us cared so much at the end, mm -hmm. and that, in a way, was part of the, the struggle and the sort of the creative battle that we all had. I mean, when you, you usually watch a TV programme, what happens is that a production company will go to a broadcaster with an idea. Generally, that idea is written by someone who doesn't appear on screen. And that idea, you go through numerous iterations. So just for people, because how many of you are me, or how many of you imagine going working in media or television? Okay. So when you're at a production company, production company does not fund their own development of an idea. They will go, so you will go at some point, I'm sure, if you're not working in production, I mean, you go there, <coughs> so I've got this idea. So they option that idea, so it becomes their property. And that option means that in the next you know, year, they can then take that to broadcasters, and this is Darth Vader again, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's kind of annoying. Um, so, sorry. So it's just turn it off. Just take it off. <laughs> Should we all just get naked? Uh, anyway, so basically, what happens is that this is really boring. But basically, I'll just hold it like that. So, yeah. so basically, what happens is that you do uh, an option. Then after that, they take it to the broadcaster. If the broadcaster likes it, they do what's called a taster or a teaser, where they'll make like ten minutes of something to give a look and feel and tonal sense of what you're doing. Now, I had done this literally around this time last year. Uh, Emeka hadn't been involved in the project at all at this point. This is something that I'd written. And then eventually the broadcaster comes back and they say yay or nay. You know, they want to do it. With the revolution we televised, it was actually going to be a Channel 4 project. We did our taste to take with Channel 4. But they said no. <laughs> Not for them. And then we ended up making it with the BBC, which I'm really glad we made it for, uh, uh, with. Because if we'd done what we were doing... And then, you know, you'd had like, uh, we'd done a fucking sketch about Vodafone, and then the first thing on the adverts is Vodafone! <laughs> it's kind of just, you know, we've been beyond satire. So, as Emeka was saying, we, we did fall out. We did, there was, there was a real struggle, because uh, it isn't an e they, they don't sit as easy bedfellows. But the point was that I was not, and Emeka was not, making this film for people who were interested in politics. That was not the objective here. The objective was to make an engaging, funny, exciting journey where young people, particularly, that we started terming the Facebook generation, because ultimately it isn't just uh, people from you know, 16 to 24, it, it can be younger or older, because actually it's about people interacting with social media who've got a different perspective on politics as a result of feeling like, you know what, who am I going to trust? Am I just going to trust the editorial of, say, the Daily Mail or... Or, or, or even the Telegraph, or am I going to trust an article that my friend has posted on my wall? Because they know that actually this is an issue that could be interesting. Because in our open source culture, what we have is huge, huge, huge amounts of news that is generated, but it becomes an attention economy. Because it's about what we give our attention to. Because, you know, there are hundreds of stories that are here today and gone tomorrow. So trying to create a narrative through all of this kind of very, very bizarre content that we were trying to create became very hard. And I think we'll use Boris as an example and flip over to you again. So if you've seen the Revolutionary Televised, I was playing a lot of characters. And when I came to the project, I'd just been in America for um, about you know, three months. I was filming there. We were dealing with a lot of people with guns. We were dealing with a lot of extreme situations pro-lifers, going into maximum security prisons, going across the Mexican border, legal weed in Colorado, that bit was fun. Uh, but, but, but it was, you know, it was really intense and I was quite exhausted. And then I started really getting very scared because when you realise that you're going to be the voice of something that's not a character, it's actually you, 
and you're putting your opinions out there, you know you're going to get negative detractors, you know that. But also it needs to feel authentic to you. And you start feeling very vulnerable and you start feeling um, very um, sensitive about how you're going to be perceived. So we, do you want to tell the voice John's story first? Okay, so so we basically had our tactics. Of, so one of the things we wanted to do was get Boris in the film because, you know, Bojo, just amazing. You know, Did anyone see that comment that he made recently about all terrorists are wankers? <laughs> just fucking amazing. All terrorists are masturbate all the time, watch Pornhub, and that's why they're terrorists. <laughs> I don't know, I've never heard of them. Um, but basically, uh, you know, we, we, we were kind of, we were kind of, we, we, we ended up finding him and he came off his bike and we decided that we were going to do this thing where we were going to try and get him to swear on the Bible to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth and then talk to him about youth engagement and we kind of went into this, what was it, he was talking about Crossrail I think at this event in Mayfair and we filmed all this stuff, none of this is in the film, uh, we filmed all this stuff and um, we got back to the office and no, he, he sort of said, look, I will talk to my people and maybe give you an interview. And I thought in my head, this is fucking bollocks. There's no way he's going to give me an interview. So I thought to make sure I get some questions out to him as soon as we had. In very similar way to say my character Dale Maley would have done. So then, you know, he comes out and he's getting on his bike. And I'm like, Boris, do you want to just swear on the Bible now? Do you want to just say to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? And he's like, listen, listen, if I ever became an MP again, you are welcome to come to the swearing-in ceremony. And then he got on his bike. And I said to him, I said to him, Careful, Boris, the London roads are dangerous. And then we got into the edit, which I thought was really funny. At the time. And then we got into the edit, and a producer who had worked with the Revolution Televised, our executive producer, who's made a lot of films with Michael Moore, and anyone who knows the Yes Men films, who's produced with those, and Emeka were sitting there, and they said, Jolly, and this is really aggressive. And, um, and I looked at him, and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about, it's funny. Like, no, it's, it's really aggressive. You need to be eminently reasonable. You know, you need to ask reasonable questions. Otherwise, and this is the point that I'm trying to make for all the media students, it doesn't matter if you're talking to, you know, Goebbels, Hitler. If it looks like you're bullying a man, the sympathy in the frame will go to your target. Because we are, all of us, emotional beings, and we will empathise with someone who we feel is under attack. And this was a big turning point in the film, so. Yeah, I mean, I think the big question is, did we succeed? Um, those who watch it will have their own opinions. Um, I think that um, in terms of my own journey, in terms of politics, um, it's kind of reinvigorated a lot of latent interests that I already had. And I suppose part of the film, um, you really, we, we made a point that actually people are interested in politics. It's just the Westminster politics that they, they've lost interest in. And in losing interest in that, in a sense, we've lost, we're losing interest in the centre ground. Um, and the reasons why we are not engaging are the reasons why he should be engaging. Um, but the difficulties um, in engaging come from so many sources. One is even the media, the way that the media um, uh, represents it. It's very hard to kind of get a sense of <coughs> what is important and, and um, uh, the, the, the best way forward now with politics. But I hope that the film at least managed to spark some people's interest and in a realisation that these issues aren't going away. That um, the, the, the world that we live in and the, the, the place that we are in um, is in a, is in the, in the process of a lot of change, and it needs this generation um, uh, who will inherit um, the mess that is lying in front of them to actually start engaging and actually start believing. Because at the end of the day, we go into this topic with this idea that young people aren't interested in politics. But there's something that everyone forgets about young people, and that being young you hold something, a very powerful political belief that, um, that older people have forgotten. And that is, you still believe that you can change the world. And in that comes an energy that can move entire generations. So 
I mean, that, 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 that's kind of, I suppose that's, that's what I came away with it from. And it would be uh, interesting to see what your takes are on all the issues about politics and, and, and uh, uh, yeah. We, I mean, the, thing, the weird thing about this film is that it wasn't just a film. It was a film documentary. It was a online petition. And uh, the BBC doesn't do campaigns. Uh, but to all intents and purposes, it was very similar to one. And it was a viral video, which we made. So we did all of these things within a film. And if you see the last 10 minutes of the film, what we tried to do is say, we want to have a national debate. How are we going to do that? Well, it is not currently a criminal offence for MPs to lie in Parliament. Now, there are very good reasons for that. And that is called parliamentary privilege. So, for instance, Tom Watson, who is a Labour MP, used parliamentary privilege to actually bring to light the alleged Westminster paedophile ring, which is, I'm sure, as we all know, something that is incredibly grave, could not be more serious, and, has, and is severe. And the, the, the argument against uh, uh, dealing with, with, with uh, you know, making a uh, lying part of the criminal offence is that this would be damaged. But, uh, we, and we decided not to include this in the film, parliamentary privilege dates back to the 1340s. Now, I know there's been at least five updates of the iPhone in the last six years, right? I'm pretty sure that we can have an update on the law, but we decided not to get into that. And this is the other thing when you're making a narrative film. You will find there are all sorts of tangents you can go on which are completely valid, but you decide what you're going to put into it. And it was amazing because we didn't even know we were going to do it. I'd never, even, I'd never met Russell Brown before making this film. Uh, you know, it wasn't like we were like, I was like, okay, cool, I'll just call Russell and, you know, he'll bring that you know. Uh, I didn't believe that we'd even be able to make contact with him properly. And within a week, we've got over 100,000 signatures, and anyone who's seen the film will know we deliver that to Parliament, where unbelievably, David Cameron is not there to greet us. Um, but it is, I completely agree with the Mecca, it is about a younger generation looking at what's happening. And I done, I did like 10, 12 different interviews with radio stations yesterday, and this came up again and again. You just need to look at what is happening in other countries to look at what may happen here. A lot of people believe that in the next general election, what may happen is you have something called a hung parliament, where no one has a majority. And you may have strange coalitions. You could have a Labour Lib Dem Green coalition, or you could have, potentially, a Conservative UKIP coalition. Now, in the example that Conservatives and the UKIP get together, they will tear themselves apart because there will be a referendum on Europe, and that will split the party. If Labour got in, they will be an austerity party. And that will mean that a lot of the people who are traditionally Labour supporters will tear apart. Some people, and one very prominent political commentator, said to me recently, what may happen is, after the election in May, there will be another election in December with three brand new party leaders because none of them have been able to command a majority. And it was reported in the press today that Conservatives are already fundraising for a second election. In Spain and Greece, what you have now is the first time you've got an anti-austerity party in Greece. But in Spain, who's heard of Podemos? Put your hand up if you've heard of them. Right, very few people. This is a new political party. They didn't even exist until last year. They're now the second biggest political party in the whole of Spain. And you know where they started? Reddit. Now, if we started a political party on Reddit, right, here, put your hands up if you know what Reddit is. Okay, good. So, Reddit, for anyone who doesn't know, Reddit is a website that is literally this basic. They put stuff on a, like, it's kind of was like a geek corner of the internet. And you literally just put stuff, and you have subreddits, like Game of Thrones subreddit is huge. Like, loads of people talking about just Game of Thrones. It's kind of about anything. But basically, it's this simple. Someone puts a comment, you got thumbs up, thumbs down. And if you put thumbs up, then it just goes up and up and up the list. Now, I would posit to you most of you are, are digital natives. You grew up with the internet. This is not a technology that Westminster understands. In fact, someone told me yesterday, he didn't even tell you this. So it was only last year that Westminster, the Palace of Westminster, got fucking Wi-Fi. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So, so basically, you know, we're living in a different age. Now, we're going to hand it over to you. But first of all, we just wanted to say thank you very much for having us. It's all about hope, not fear. And, you know, I hope that you enjoyed the film. So thank you, thank you. Yes. Um, you said there were two.
two things you liked about the uh, pro uh, program proposal. Mm. What was the one thing you didn't like? You said there were three things. The time schedule we had to do it in. Mm. Um, and there were some of the ideas that they had were in terms of the editorial um, laws that we are governed by, very difficult. To As in BBC laws? Yeah, um, uh, very difficult to achieve. Um, so that, that, that was the thing that uh, I, I didn't like. And yeah, I, I was convinced that there was something there to make an interesting political film. So I was, I was sold. Um, yeah. Yeah. We had basically like three things, which were like, don't lie to me, listen to me, <laughs> and represent me. It's the three emotional causes of the film. But basically, we've been making a different film before. So this is also what happens in television, right? So you write all this stuff up, they give you like three months to do it. You film something, and then the feedback that came back was, yeah, no, cool, yeah, right. So we saw them joining as a presenter. That's great, cool, right. But the thing is, right, we just have to have a completely new idea. <laughs> and we were like, what? We haven't got any more money. We're like, yeah, I know, because we just got no money to make it. But there is this Magna Carta 800 year anniversary coming up. So come, and I was in India, right, traveling around whilst I got this message. And then I thought, well, if you put a 2.0 next to Magna Carta, someone in telly would be like, right, yeah, Magna Carta 2.0. That's great. I love it. And fucking they did. So we ended up like, like, starting like that. But just to say, anyone in media who's going to go into television, that is how. So we literally rewrote the whole film on that basis. And it's funny, isn't it? Because the film we actually made and the initial treatment just completely, completely Some of the, the emotional core of the two things, but yeah. I'm sure someone's told this to you before, but a film is made three times. It's made when you think about it and you write it down, and it's made again when you shoot it. It's made for a third time when you edit it. Who's got another question? Do you think that, in a sense, um, social media might be perpetuating not voting for young people nowadays? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Why? a lot of people say that the thing about social media, right, is that you decide who to listen to and you basically just get a kind of box of people that just say exactly what you want to hear because you're like, I don't even like what he's saying, so just unfollow or unfriend him. And that's really dangerous. Like, I make a point of like following a lot of people I don't like on Twitter because I genuinely want to see what's going on. It's just the same as if you just read one newspaper or you just took one source of media because it's, an, it's just an echo chamber of, you know, what, what you want to hear and it's, it's very dangerous. I, I can see, I, I agree with that. Um, I can see how it could do the opposite as well because there's there's so much information. Yeah, there's so much information that's coming to us now. Um, we live in an extraordinary time, and I think that few people realise that even 20 years ago, if you had an argument at a dinner table um, about some issue to do with abortion, you'd have to go to the library mm. to resolve it. Now you pull out the bullshit detector and you text it. Um, no, not text it. You you do a search, and it, it's a way of kind of introducing people to so many more issues. You have the petitions, which is something that we used. Um, so there are the things that can spark engagement, um, uh, and also it became a very powerful weapon in the hands of young people who got engaged in the Scottish referendum. They um, helped take the referendum online, counter the spin that the Westminster machine um, already had on their side, which was the national press was all pro, um, uh, all pro uh, staying together. Um, and in the past, an election would have been won um, uh, because they were leading in the polls. They had the support in the press, home, um, home run, basically. But social media changed that. And the funny Likewise. thing as well about social media is I bet most of you lot in here know how to use social media better than people who run the main head offices at the, at the political parties. It's really strange when you start realising that what you have, what you have is just like your intuitive sense of the, the technology and how to use it is completely different from, from what they've got. I mean, what you would have said. No, I just wrote it. No, just, just wrote it. <laughs> um, one of my things is, so you are a you get in. You know, what noise do you listen to and which channels and how do you? Because 
that's what Nick Clegg's been on TV saying recently, is right. actually you need strong leadership, or the country wants a strong leadership, but at the same time, he's saying he listening that. to us. <laughs> Yeah. What, I just laughed that he said that. <laughs> <laughs> did he say that? Yeah. yeah, he did. And he was trying to be popular and less ironic, but at the same time, yeah. it is, it, if you put yourself in their shoes, who do they listen to? How do they? Well, they can't even understand how to do the social media stuff. Well, I don't, I don't think they, you know, they, you've got to be, look, just being totally honest, yeah? Politicians don't give a shit about you. I don't give a toss about you. you are, you're a percentage of people who don't vote, right? 97% of pensioners vote, right? Under 24% of young people are, are, are planning to vote. I was speaking to some groups who bite the ballot recently. Three billion pounds was saved by the government on tuition fees, which is exactly the same amount if you means test is the bus pass and the old age pensioners allowance, right? Which would mean that rich people, people who made a certain income, wouldn't get the free bus pass. Guess how much you'd save? Three billion pounds, exactly the same. But they shafted students because they knew they wouldn't really get much comeback because people are so alienated. They're like, hey, no, no, no. the system, man, is fucked. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, why fucking vote, man? Because what's the point, you know? And I find that just ridiculous because the thing is that, like, you, why is the big deal about voting? It's just like, it only takes five minutes. Just go down to a weird little primary school where some woman who probably works in a local shop called Doris is like giving you a form and your name's spelt wrong. They don't even have your bloody proper name on the, on the registration form. I went to Camden the other day, I was like, my name's Jolly and Rubinstein, not Joy Lon Rubinstein. They're like, yeah, yeah, no problem. Two days later, a message from Camden. Uh, Joy Lon Rubinstein, we've changed your name to Joy Lon Rubinstein. <laughs> no joke. And it's like, you know, it's ridiculous, but that's part of the process, you know? But also, I'm in a different position to most of you. Like, I know war correspondents. I know people who've been in Afghanistan when the vote was opened up to women, right? Who've seen a mile of people who are 70 years old who've never voted, right? Who are desperate to be able to put their point across. Who've seen people blown up to try and get a vote, right? And they're voting. And the fact is, it hasn't affected people here yet. You know, if you look at what's happening in Greece, it's because people like primary school teachers were made homeless because they couldn't pay their rent, right? It was, it's terrifying. And that is the reality. It's only when you start realizing that this is going to affect me in a very real, very tangible way that you go, shit, I better participate. And the reality is with students is that, you know, right now we're in this very bizarre position where probably disenchantment with politics has probably never been this high. You know, Russell's become like this, or the media would like to believe Russell's become this kind of high priest, you know? But then Russell made a truth the other day where he was like, well, if there was a party like there was in Greece, I'd vote. And it's like, you know, yes, exactly. So we need new political parties. How many people registered to vote here? Hang on, hang on, put your hands right up. How many of you are registered to vote? Okay. I'd like to hear genuinely, and this no one's going to get pillared here at all. From the people who aren't registered to vote, is it? Put put your hand up if it's just like I'm not sure how to do it. Is it if, if that's the reason. so one or two? Is it is it that you you just don't believe in voting? Put your hand if you don't believe it's going to make any difference. No one. They probably know. I just guess. Does everyone here believe in the political system? Does everyone believe here that their vote will make a difference? It's not to put my hand up. I think. It's about power, and I think people in this room, particularly if you are younger and it will be the first time that you vote, you need to understand your power. You need to understand that power is an ability to achieve a purpose. It's not good or evil, it depends on the purpose. That's Martin Luther King's statement. But each of you in this room has power. It's about how you use it. Political power is about holding elected officials to account. And you walk into that ballot box, and it is the most amazing experience that for that moment, and you run up and you stand there with a stubby pencil, and you pick who is going to run the country. Because 300 years ago, 200 years ago, we did it with guns and knives and whoever had the strongest army. And now it's done relatively peacefully. But you have to understand your power. It is the most amazing experience. And it's not just about voting 
about being part of civic society, about making a difference, being broadcasters, making useful, socially purposeful films like these guys have done. Yeah, I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I appreciate your intent. I really do, and I'm not trying to undermine it at all. That isn't how I feel about it. Right? But you're but I jaded think that... and old, and I'm young and... Well, exactly, <laughs> young and pure. Exactly. And we haven't only just met. No, 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 it's sexy, I like it. But what I was gonna, just, just to say, and we'll, we'll come to your point. The political system right now we have is called first past the post. It means if I get 999 votes and you get 998, right, then those 998 votes, they don't count in that one place. That's a joke. There needs to be proportional representation around the country, right? There isn't. Why isn't there? Because it doesn't serve the interests of those people who currently are the incumbents of power. Right? So I don't feel the same about voting, but I understand what you mean. Right? The point is that there was a time when women didn't have the vote. There was a time where all, all my black friends up there, right? You, they were fucking slavery. Right? And it seemed impossible to deal with. It seemed like it would never change. And it changed because people said, this is fucked. And we're not doing this anymore. Right? And that is the reality, is that it's only when there is a certain kind of I guess a kind of, um, a, a, yes, a rebellion to an extent, but also more of a kind of, the consciousness gets to the point where you're like, we can't be dealing with this anymore, that things start changing. And voting is a part of that process. But I completely agree with Russell as well. You can do stuff, those girls did stuff, it became active, they were active in their situation. But that's what Jazz said to me. She was like, I've never thought of myself as political, but I acted upon the situation that affected me, so therefore I became an activist. <laughs> She didn't consider herself political. Sorry, what were you going to say? No, you just basically answered my question. I was going to say... That's weird, you, that shit. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say... So right. I was going to say, do you agree with the first past the post system? No. So, if, like, you just answer it, because I don't personally agree with... The but how do you change it? Well, I don't know. Like, do you go by, like, what Australia does? Like, yeah. everyone yeah. has to vote. Like, yeah, it's illegal not to us. Yeah, like, which there are other, like, like the AP, rep like, the representative. There's loads of different mm. ways, but... Like, which one would work But best? what I mean is, how do you even yeah. have that discussion? You only have that discussion by by coming in to, to, to power. You know? You're looking at you raise your hand? Yeah, um, I think that I come from a similar background from you, actually. I went to the University of Sussex, did international relations. I think I'm probably a bit younger than you. Um, well, I'm really old. <laughs> I'm 33, how old are you? 32. Well, made my day, made my day. No, I'm more but, tired than you, are. <laughs> Probably not, no, I'm the Labour candidate. You flirt me. <laughs> no. um, I think, when so I... So you're a Labour candidate? Yeah, I'm Labour candidate. No, you candidate. are more jaded then. Yeah. <laughs> so you no, are I'm probably still engaged. reasonably hopeful. About um, Ed? No, about what we can do to change the country. About that. I think, when people say that young people don't care about politics, I think that's entirely, entirely wrong, because every time I've come to the University of Brighton, I've worked with the media students, they've been totally engaged, but it's about issues that matter to them and their community as well, and I think you're right, Westminster politics is probably at its worst when it's just telling us what to do. Some of the best campaigns that we've run here locally have come from the ground, mm. from going out, talking to people, doing the stuff that you probably would never want to film, watching us knock on a door and talk to people probably the most boring movie ever, except for the ones that come to the door naked. Surprising number of people Literally, come to that's door. my first series of the revolution. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. So many people come naked. But I think, why are we saying young people should just vote? I think they should be getting involved in politics and standing. I think they really should, because politics and democracy at the moment is only made up of the people who are in it. And if there aren't people who look like you, sound like you in politics, then why don't you put yourself forward? So why did you decide to become a Labour candidate? Because... I, my dad's a fireman, my mum's a nurse, I worked in the NHS, I went into people's homes as a care assistant, and there was this one occasion where I was, it was a private healthcare company that was uh, contracted out from the local health authority, so I had NHS patients, I had private patients, no idea who they were. Um, and one time I went in, saw this woman, she was in a pretty shitty state if I'm honest, and it was going to take me longer than 20 minutes to clean her up, so I stayed. And my boss of the care company just kept phoning, and she said, 
you're late for your next appointment. And my next appointment, I was literally just cleaning the house. I was vacuuming and cleaning her kitchen. And I explained the situation, and she said, yeah, but your next client's private, and you'll be losing us a lot of money. Sure. Now, I didn't have any like family to feed or anything like that, so I stood up to her and I said, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to do this. But I realised quite quickly, if I didn't change the system from the outside, it didn't matter how many times I defied my boss, and I saw politics as the route for that, I don't see... I, don't, I haven't given up on politics. No, I, I, I haven't given up on politics either. No. But what's difficult about the Labour Party is that not only did you, as a party, open up the privatisation of the NHS, <laughs> and not only do you actually have currently advising you on your tax policy, Price Waterhouse Kubu just been showed to be exporting industrial scale tax avoidance that Margaret Hodge said in the select committee the other day but you are an all step and I'm not please understand you you've decided to take a certain badge right I'm not everything you're saying I completely understand but what I, and I, also please understand it's not a personal attack. no I know I and I really it's... sympathize with what you're saying because... but the problem with your party and the problem that you're in right now is that in a lot of people's minds the Conservative Party has done a lot of work to basically open up, to, to further the changes that Tony Blair started. And in a lot of people's minds, Labour had a really big open goal for four years to kick something, to kick a policy, and to stand with people. For instance, those two women, we just saw Jasmine and Sam, the Labour councillor. And recently, like, the tax avoidance. And you've seen what's happened. As soon as we stand up about tax avoidance, yeah. you've seen the barrage of insults that we've had. You've seen the criticism that we've had. Yeah, but you and accept I think what that, I'm I saying. Think, I accept that parties. actually parties change, but they are also only what they're made up of. Yeah. The reason why I joined the Labour Party was I had a councillor knock on my door. They knew I was relatively left-leaning. They knew yeah. I came from a Labour family, public services. Yeah. And it was just when they were about to go and war in Iraq. And right. it's exactly what I didn't want, what I saw as my party traditionally doing. And he said, we've got a choice. You can either stand outside and criticise it, or you can get involved and make it the party that you want it to be again. I respect and that. that's what I did. Yeah, well, yeah, I respect that, totally. <laughs> looking, looking at the film, I thought it was quite interesting that people talk about politics, and then they talk about Westminster politics. Yeah. I don't think Westminster politics exists. That's part of the problem. I think the politics was out in that street where people yeah. were saying things. And if you actually asked them and found what motivated them to be there, in a very healthy way, might have been a hundred different reasons yeah. that got them all together, a hundred different experiences, and yet all they see, they don't see Westminster politics, they see Westminster political parties, mm. and out of it you end up with probably two arguments, three at best, or maybe four where you could actually really hate one of them, five? you know what I mean? Five, where you hate two of them, <laughs> but you know that some of those are actually so hateful that they probably won't get into power, so you're actually back to the two. And this, what is happening is that party politics has just created a situation when the debate is between two quite close sides. Yeah. It's two sides of a coin which is pretty similar on either side. Tweedle and what, tweedle and what people are trying to do is actually say it's more nuanced, it's more intelligent, it's more deep, and there's a lot more going on. It's, and can we actually have a conversation about yeah. that and then something might happen? Well, that thing, conversation, is an interesting idea as well, because obviously anyone who's seen Prime Minister's Question Time will know that at best it's a bunch of you know, formerly public school boys jeering each other in a way that you literally wouldn't see in a lot of other parliaments. But something that struck us, and this is a real thing, was, so the first time we tried to get into Parliament, uh, eight policemen surrounded me and said, you are definitely not coming in because of stuff we've done before, and we eventually waited an hour, and the second time the same thing happened. But we were walking through, we went to see the Youth Parliament, and there's a place in the Palace of Westminster called the Great Hall, and it has a roof on it from 12.15. It is absolutely beautiful, right? genuinely, absolutely beautiful. And it is a gigantic, colossal space, and you feel the weight of history as soon as you walk in there. And immediately it struck me that this is a different world. This is not the world outside. And a lot of people who walk in there with the best intentions find that way to crushing them down. The first thing I would do, and I think in the same way what we're seeing in Greece, I think we will see this more and more, is new political parties. First thing I would do if I was involved in Westminster is shut Westminster. It is a museum to the past. It has no place 
in collegial collaborative politics. The two leaders, Ed Miliband and, and uh, uh, David Cameron at the minute, they stand two swords lengths apart, literally. That is what it is measured by. Two long swords. It's totally bizarre. I totally disagree. I wouldn't shut Westminster because I think that one thing that I've come across with, and this is mm. the, the beauty of political debate, and one thing that I came away with was this understanding that the system that we have and the knowledge that we share as human beings is knowledge that hasn't come about from the last 50 years. The civilization that we enjoy came by the Ottomans, um, uh, by the Egyptians, by innumerable civilizations which gathered knowledge and stored it and passed it on to the rest of us. And we are all the wellsprings of that knowledge, as is our democracy, which is something that at the same time as being the thing that governs us all, is a system that has developed over a period of, of, of hundreds of years. And from that comes um, hundreds of years of checks and balances. And uh, so for example, I'll give you an example. I mean, to me, it seemed ludicrous that politicians were allowed to lie in Parliament. Um, but then when you learn about it, there's a thing called parliamentary privilege. And that if this is the place where politicians can go to represent the people, they should be able to say what they want without fear of the powerful coming against them. That's where it comes from. And that law is born of hundreds of years of experience. So I would treasure that. And I would kind of try and recapture it. Because at the moment, what's happening is we have this thing which is called the democratic mandate. And the democratic mandate is a thing that's ruling us. But at the same time, we have this deficit, which is an interest in the people that are holding that mandate. And as a result, you have, partially out of sheer indolence and the fact that we have so much provided for us, a population that casts their vote and then forgets about it, doesn't care about the detail. And it's in that detail that politi politics is slowly being moved away from the people. So I would keep Westminster open, but I would try and... Uh, there's, there's something that I want to t tell you about, and then we'll come to you up there and, and you over there. We, we, and then we'll come, come over to you. So in, in, um, in Argentina, there is a thing called uh, Democracy OS. It's an app for your phone. And it started basically as a crowdsourced uh, Kickstarter project. And basically what it was, was a tool which basically mirrored exactly what was going on in the Argentinian parliament. And it kind of... De debunked, as in like it stopped, it, in most simple terms, said, this is what they're discussing in Parliament today. And it was not in legalese, it was in common parlance, so everyone could, could understand it. And they wanted, in the same way that someone in Parliament was voting, you to vote on the issue. But it also said, you know, maybe Emeka knows more about this than me. You know what, you can give your vote to Emeka if you think that's a good idea. And so in that way, it mirrored the political system. Now, this is a type of direct democracy. Now, they ended up, first of all, it, it, it got 28,000, then 100,000, 150,000. And I would recommend anyone to look at the TED talk uh, on Democracy OS, the app, because it's really, really interesting. Because it already exists, this stuff already exists out there. And basically, they eventually decided, because they went to the party, they were like, look, we've got this thing, they're like, not interested. Um, they decided to run a candidate. And this candidate said, I will only do what the app tells me to do. That's it. No free will, I'll just do what you know, 100,000 people tell me to do. And they came second in, in, in their election. But it scared the parliament enough to actually take it on. So then when they did a survey about parks, uh, they were looking at, um, they were looking at uh, uh, you know, public spaces and stuff like that, and a number of others that I can, can't really remember. Um, you know, this became part of it. So there are new ways of kind of imbuing what I'm saying with, with modern technology. So, you, sir, up there, and then we'll come to you. The there, sir, and we'll go to you. Uh, I have um, a small question for you. Uh, Would you consider running for parliament? Yes, yeah, I will. Yeah. Yeah. One day. Because that's good, because uh, what you see is a lot of, uh, in the media, you get people like Russell Brand who are publicised and say that they're the voice of our gem particular demographic, and there are people who stepped out and said that they wouldn't run for election. Yeah. And it is like the candidate in front row said, the party is made up of no one to stand up and talk to us. People say that young people aren't interested in politics. I mean, if you're between the ages of 18 and 24, you're eligible to vote, but you're not going to be able to stand for election, and you're not going to be able to stand for parliament. Most people who go into parliament and they're successful, the people who study politics at uni, if you're between the ages of 18 and 24, you're probably still sitting in a dorm room somewhere eating. Mm -hmm. 
And that is good. <laughs> it always tastes better the next day. <laughs> Is that where you're from? Uh, no, I'm not from Newham, I'm from Hackney. But they've got um, a large population of like, people who are from ethnic minorities, people who are living on uh, like, uh, the lower like, incomes of society. And at the same time, their member of parliament, he, he knows that he only has to stand and represent a certain faction of his like, constituency to be like, received. Do you get what I mean? He gets yeah. re-elected and he gets re-elected. And what we need is the people, well, the people like yourselves. And like you, mate. Because I'd listen to you. Yeah. I mean it. The people that you talk to are they want to they want to help us, they want to engage with you. Like it feels like even watching your film, I watched it earlier today. To be honest, as someone who's interested in politics, I know you said you weren't making it for people who are interested in politics, but you made it about youth engagement in politics and it was called an idiot's guide to politics. That's insulting. That's patronizing. That's not we're, we're not idiots and we know these things, but we haven't gone no, enough and life idiots. Yet. Guide to politics. Enough, but I get that. Yeah, I get yeah. what you're saying. No, but I totally understand yeah. that. The reality is, actually, that title is decided by the broadcaster. Yeah, well, I, I, we I were assumed gonna... as much. I'm yeah. journalist, I assumed as much. So yeah, no, no. What I'm saying was that that's how they perceive us. They, yeah. These are people in control of the media. I wanted, to make, I wanted to call it Maybelline history. But the reality is that what you what you just said, and I think being the change you want to see, like, politics isn't something that's done to you, it's something you do. Like, I would listen to you for a long time. You're a cogent orator. Never undermine your own power. You now, for a long time, I sat there and I realized that I didn't feel like I was enough, right? I didn't feel like I was going to succeed and I'd whip myself off, right? And then I decided, fuck that, right? Because I decided I wanted to write programs. I was making films and working at the Financial Times after being at Sussex Uni, doing a year abroad, they're doing a, a, a two-year master's at a film school, starting a production company, maybe branded content, trying to make promos, trying to hustle. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't see a way out. And I realized that a lot of that was to do with the fact that I was not prepared to be at peace with myself and accept in myself that it was an, I was enough, right? That I was, I was always looking for something else to validate me. And then I just was like, you know what, the reality is, the reason I'm not trying to do what I want to do is because I believe that I'm sabotaging myself. And all I would say to you, man, is I would listen to you for a very long time. You know, you're a strong orator, believe me.